the calcium carbonate. Um, it's super fun as a scientist to work on this stuff because it's such a new industry, it's such a new field. There's so much green space to explore. So if you're a scientist, and even if you're not in like inorganic chemistry, or something that sounds like it's uh, closely related, come talk to me maybe after the event is concluded. Um, there's also generally at companies like this, we're both for just people who are really motivated by the mission and, and smart and excited to learn. Um, probably also people with um, maybe like a techno-economic analysis background, that, that sort of thing, to do projections of uh, sort of directions the company could go and like financial modeling, things, uh, LCA, life cycle analysis modeling, things like that. Um, there's engineering roles at our pilot plant. We're going to be expanding a lot of the pilot plant over the next year or two and there will probably always be roles for uh, people with chemical engineering or uh, civil engineering backgrounds. And then, as I said earlier, if you are uh, in anything, any other type of field, there are roles at carbon tech companies and climate tech companies for all of the jobs that would normally need to be done in a business. There's a person who builds the website and posts on our LinkedIn, right? There's people who sign the purchase orders and make sure that our vendors get paid and when I buy like some fancy new piece of uh, chemistry equipment that those people get paid, right? There's people in every single role who are motivated by the mission, who are excited to be working there. Um, I would also like to plug an uh, organization called Work on Climate, which I am not affiliated with, but oh, it sounds like we have some Work on Climate fans here, that's amazing. Um, my friend Cassandra Shia started that uh, she and the co-founder of that, Eugene, quit their jobs at Google as software engineers to figure out what software engineers can do about climate. And so if you are a software engineer, um, I'm, I would encourage you to check out Work on Climate because there's a lot of other uh, very awesome people who are thinking about the same thing very deeply and they will probably have much better advice than I do. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I echo everything that everyone said already. Every job should be a climate job. Every job will be a climate job. Um, just try. Uh, we are hiring a lot at 12. I said, you know, earlier we doubled in size, and so we hire across everything. That's talent, finance. Like, we hire for different industries too. We really value people from different backgrounds. Like, one of our engineers was like ran a motorcycle shop for 20 years, and she's a badass, and like she's our engineer. Like, she didn't have. She studied sculpture in college, and is just like really good with you know really handy so we really value you know diversity and like where people come from um, but the only thing I will say is that I want to dispel the myth that climate is not gonna is a sacrifice that climate is going to mean taking a pay cut and climate is going to mean like having a long work long hours and like trudge through the mud that is something that is changing and part of it is because VCs are finally getting to the point where they've been spend money and they want to invest in climate tech companies. At 12, we raised $200 million to this point. There are other companies in this space who raised upwards of $100, $200 million. And it's because things are changing and VCs know how to think about climate tech now. Partially, I think, because there are companies that have been successful despite the climate, such as uh, Tesla and SolarCity and those companies. Um, Historically, there was a boom and bust in 2008 where a lot of companies got fed because they didn't understand clean tech, and so VCs kind of shied away from it for like a decade plus, but that's totally changing now. So I wanted to spell that message with the Kima working climate. Can I say one other? Please. Okay. Um, so I also have a piece of career advice that I like to give to people who want to work at companies like the ones represented by the ones on stage, people on stage. Uh, so these small companies are creating a lot of jobs. Most new jobs that are created are created by small companies. So if you are looking for a job, that is like really a great place to focus just by sheer numbers. And then on top of that, small companies often don't have any resources to put a lot of time into like writing job ads, getting them approved, like putting them through whatever steps in the company, checking hundreds of resumes that come in. There's often, I think probably the people on stage would, would agree that there's 
always more to do than the people who work there are able to do. There's not enough hours in the day to get everything done, and therefore these companies are very often in the need of a lot of eager people who are motivated by the mission at any point. And so if you are interested in a company, don't wait for them to post a job ad. They might really need you and not have time or energy or resources to be able to go through that formal process. And really, I would highly recommend, this is how I, uh, I, I got a job this way, I would really highly recommend just reaching out to uh, someone at the company saying how excited and motivated you are by their mission and what they're doing. Drop, uh, like, like brag a little bit about uh, whatever it is that you think you can bring to the company and attach your resume. And that is probably, a, that, that's a very, very good way to get a job at one of these uh, small climate tech or any other like small tech commission driven companies. That's great. I, I actually remember one more thing too. We are hiring a business development associate that's going to be on my team and we rarely have a business opening so check that out because we are looking right now. CIBC is also hiring for their climate tech effort. <laughs> <laughs> but now I think it's time for uh, Q&A. Um, so anyone has a question, please uh, come on up. Um, I think maybe we just have to bring the mic to you. Thank you. So my question is, the, the common wisdom about carbon capture is that it's really expensive, it's far in the future, it's not going to get to scale until it's cost neutral. So what can you say to give this room some hope that, that carbon capture will actually make a difference, say, in the next 10 years against that 40 gigaton problem that we talked about at the very beginning? So we'd like to have some hope. Well, let me walk start off. Please. Sure. Uh, at Blue Planet, we have people out the door who want to partner with us. We have so many inbound requests coming in. I think that there is uh, something special about Blue Planet's technology where we are very flexible. We can partner with pretty much any form of CO2, so that could be anywhere from like direct air capture, that's the easiest thing to do, or like all the way to very, very dilute CO2 streams, like a natural gas power plant. And the fact that our technology is super flexible means that it can be deployed today. It doesn't need all of these additional steps and uh, additional energy intensive processes that some of the other um, the other technologies might need. So that's like a huge advantage to us. The, on the market side, uh, just to, um, I guess to say briefly, um, there is a LEED certification, which you probably heard of, which is a certification for green buildings. And that has already enormously taken off. There's tons of buildings that are being built with LEED certifications. We envision something similar for the embodied carbon in a building structure. So people would pay a premium to have a carbon neutral or even carbon negative building with their concrete. And uh, Blue Planet's working on a certification for that. So this would be analogous to Energy Star. We call it Carbon Star. And it is a certification that has an accounting for the amount of embodied carbon in the concrete. So either emissions, pretty much all, con no, not pretty much, all concrete that's currently out there has a very high uh, carbon footprint. And we could actually have a negative carbon footprint concrete, uh, which is calculated through this Energy Star rating. And we're hoping that that will be becoming a uh, term that people are very familiar with in the architecture world and that it will become something like a oh, lead building, you'll have like a carbon star, uh, negative carbon building. Yeah, I'd say one of the things that makes me really excited about this space and really optimistic for the future is seeing, I mean, 
all of us kind of were there like a few years ago when there wasn't that many companies in this space and it was a relatively, like people just kind of brushed it aside. And I remember the turning point for me at least was in 2018 when the IPCC report was uh, published and they basically said that they needed, you absolutely need negative emissions technologies in order to reach our climate goals. And so it is already locked in that we need these technologies if we're going to uh, hit our milestones from a climate perspective. And I think one of the things that makes me um, really excited from just an another thing is the advanced market commitments that are taking place. Stripe is leading the charge there and supplying some of the demand for these companies as they scale up at Mars Materials. We're developing relationships with a lot of these direct air capture companies so that once they reach the scale, they'll have an off-taker um, that can then utilize that captured CO2. And so you're slowly starting to see these markets form and it's a really exciting place to be. So I, I would just say, yeah, there's a lot of change, a lot of funding, a lot of support, a lot of excitement surrounding this space at the moment. And it's been incredible to see the development. And I would say if you just continue to follow it into the future, there's every reason to, to still be optimistic about the cost falling and there being demand and there being opportunity to turn these carbon dioxide uh, offshoots into valuable products. Uh, I'm going to make a clarification on terms because I'm a stickler about this. So uh, you said carbon capture, which which typically refers to capture at the point source point source emission. So that's from like a cement plant, for instance. Direct air capture is separate and different, and that is capturing it from the air. And that is maybe what you're referring to as quite expensive. Like the target price right now that companies are all working for is $100 per ton. Um, and that is something that hasn't happened yet. That number has been set since you know a few years ago when there were literally three companies working on it. It was Climeworks, Global Thermostat, and Carbon Engineering. And there are so many companies that are working on it now. There's new ones coming out every other week. Um, and if anyone here knows about director capture, you know, think about it. There's plenty of plenty of opportunity to go make a carbon removal company from that. And the government, it's actually one of the things Congress can agree on to fund because director capture has so much universal. Uh, appeal and so there's a lot of legislation. There's currently legislation and law actually to put funding into DAC hubs around the U.S. because the U.S. wants to or wants to be the leader in carbon technologies and that's going to accelerate things even faster. Um, but yeah, and then the carbon capture side, which is just point source capture, uh, is typically twenty to fifty dollars a ton. Uh, that's like Department of Energy numbers, and that is already a well understood technology and well developed and already deployed at pretty low scales. Just to add a fine point on this is that I've been doing climate for 20 plus years and in Silicon Valley there's something I heard called Moore's Law. And that also implies climate technology. So when I started 20 years ago, you know, solar panels were for satellites and for NASA. Now you have on everything. Same thing for wind power. And you are now seeing this in the carbon. So I think one of the most powerful climate solutions is great entrepreneurs the hope, persistence, and vision. And the vision is to see not where the price of carbon is now, but where the price of carbon is. And I'll have I have a mic, so I will come find you. Also, hi everyone. My name is Angelina. I'm the event manager. Thank you, Angelina. Yeah. mentioned, I think it came up several times, that there's a lot of funding in this space. I work for a nonprofit uh, tech company and the program, a program manager for our climate tech program. So we're obviously looking for funding. Um, and so I was curious to know, like you had mentioned the number that I would kill for. Um, and so I was looking, so I was wondering like where you guys have found your funding, how have you secured your funding um, to start? Because I'm assuming you're all for profit. Um, and so yeah, I'd be interested if people don't mind me hijacking the conversation That's to learn a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, I don't know what applies to the nonprofit space, but I do know, so specifically, like, uh, like Christian had mentioned, like, Sprint is a company that has put money into buying ahead uh, products ahead of time. So there are companies like um, I hope they don't, no one's here from the company. It's a, it's a nonprofit that uh, puts olamine across beaches, which allows 
uh, project management, thank you. The hive mind up here is working. Um, so yeah, um, they were a nonprofit when they were first got, got their first purchase from uh, Shopify. So they're, and they were purchasing at like $200, $300 a ton of CO2, and that would allow them to start deploying. So I know that that is a venue that I've seen nonprofits work with. We have primarily venture capital funding, so for, I think that only works to for profit, but we also uh, have funding from family offices. And I know there are foundations like the Packard Foundation that is using the language of carbon removal, and foundations would be a good way to look into it. That's as far as I think I, I know. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I would say primarily for, for us at least, it's venture and it makes a, a grant funding as well. Um, so I would also look into different grant opportunities that are offered um, either federally or in the state of California um, that could be of, of use. Also, um, if, if you have an exciting like, consumer application, um, you could look into crowdfunding as well. I, I haven't specifically uh, done that, gone that route. Um, but that seems like a pretty um, popular route as well, and I, I know some nonprofits that have done that. So. We, we also did, we have a lot of grant funding. That, that is a huge part of our like, early stage development because VC funding wasn't enough to do all the development we needed to. So and it's free money. It doesn't come from a, it doesn't come with strings. Like you don't have to pay it back or anything like that. It's not there's no equity involved. So I think that'd be good. Our funding is primarily from corporate partners, so I'm not sure how helpful that is. <laughs> so can you just even for profit? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not true. I, I think you should, I can't tell you someone, I, I, I have a shout out to my work on climate of air miners. Some people yeah. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, well, <laughs> air miners is great. Uh, it's a carbon removal community online. It's like the biggest carbon removal uh, and they used, used to be SF based and in person, but now it's all online. Uh, but Tito may know something, so maybe I can introduce you. Yeah, maybe we can talk after. Yeah. I, I should also probably take a crack at this question yeah. um, for nonprofit funding. Um, uh, we are operating on a brief use string budget that was provided by my last employer, who I want to plug and say thank you to. They're also hiring for a front end engineer, even. Uh, Kairos Aerospace um, does uh, greenhouse gas emissions monitoring and mitigation. Um, and really, I was working there, and um, Kairos uh, does a lot of work with the oil and gas industry, and um, they are sort of a little, um, uh, they have sort of like two faces, right? So when you're talking with people in Houston about like your product, you don't brag about your carbon footprint because they tell you to get out. Um, but you know, on the other hand, everybody who works there is very mission oriented, and they all wanted to have an opportunity to make, uh, to have sort of a carbon facing um, part of the company that wasn't really part of the company. And so what they did was they funded me to put on educational events that are found, that are um, uh, uh, sponsored by Kairos Aerospace. Um, with that said, I would like to do a lot more of these. And so if you are interested in funding a nonprofit, you should come find me. But uh, we were able to raise through your donations uh, $400 for this event, which um, is going to more than offset the cost of our one part-time um, employee for this month. So I really appreciate everybody who uh, clicked that little box and helped pay for uh, part of this event tonight. Um, we've been very this side of the room centric. Does anyone have questions on that side? For being here, like all very fascinating things that you said, I, w I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the risks and mitigations that you have gone through and the timeline that you expect to like really get more of a, a, a massive uptake on, on these solutions. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, I'd say the primary risk um, with developing our technology lies within the feedstock. So as I mentioned on the slide, the primary feedstock to the process is a 3 hydroxypropionic acid. It can be derived via a biomass fermentation route or a carbon dioxide utilization route. 
And so the carbon dioxide utilization route is something we're actively exploring. We're also exploring several other pathways in order to get to scale. So we um, applied for grant opportunities to further develop this feedstock pathway, and there are commercial um, routes to produce the material, but we're actively working to mitigate those, those processes. And also, in the scale-up roadmap, um, I would also say there's several risks. While our technology it uses a lot of conventional process unit operations that exist today, so pretty um, standard reactors and distillation columns, um, but for our process, we also recycle a lot of the material that goes through the process, so ammonia and solvents that are used in the separations process, or ammonia is used in the reaction, the solvents are used in the separations. And so as we do the pilot scale work and then uh, over the next couple of years, we'll be looking to integrate and optimize the reactor system and separations, and that can be pretty tricky, especially as you scale up. Um, so I'd say that's a pretty uh, big risk um, there, but we're looking again to hire a rock star process engineer two, process engineer three, VP of engineering to guide that work. Um, and then one final thing I'd say is that over the course of the next uh, five years, we plan to launch the first of a kind commercial facility. So we have um, the next couple of years to develop a pilot, the next three years to develop a demonstration scale unit, and then ultimately we plan to launch that first of a kind unit, commercial unit, that is able to produce 50,000 tons of the coal nitrile per year. So those timelines are really tight, especially when you consider all of the work that has to be done to reach that point. But um, like I said, we, the de-risking of the technology is kind of inherent to the process. If you have a simpler process, it's easier to scale up. And so I'd say that's primarily where we mitigate that risk, is we're using technologies that already exist. We're using feedstock that's commercially available. And now it's up to our team to execute and find, uh, basically put all the pieces together. Uh, right now, our primary uh, target is to scale up our core technology. So that's the, the module that's going to be giving us the tons per day scale CO2 conversion. Um, and so there is you know, some risk ahead of us. Uh, we're doing a lot of engineering studies and working with um, leading engineering procurement and structure companies, EPCs, who know this stuff. They have experts who can consult with to build out those uh, designs ahead of time. We're also ordering things ahead of time because we know about the supply chain issues. Um, those are real, they hit everyone. Um, but then historically, we have scaled up our first, the first membrane we ever made, I was not part of the company, was the size of a postage stamp, it's like that small. And the one that is gonna go into this industrial system is like this big. And a lot of work had to go into that, that's like six, seven years of development. And a lot of that work and de-risking was from the grants that we got and working with the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy actually, they think ahead in like decades. They think ahead maybe like 10 years ahead and they really do put money into new technology development, de-risking at that scale and putting in money to do that. So if you're developing new technology, like DOE is a great place to, to get grants and to help do that work. Let's see, so I would say at this point, probably a lot of the risk is just like engineering risk. And that is pretty much things that we have seen coming for a while and know how to address, like know how to put resources on those things. Um, and for the things that are sort of outside of our usual, or like core technologies, we are partnering with uh, companies who are the best in the world in that. So, um, an example is our air contactor. We um, are partnering with a company who's like best in the world in air contactors, and they have been doing this for many decades, and um, they are going to like design, we're sort of uh, utilizing our strategic partnerships that we have with suppliers and strategic partnerships with investors um, who we have been fostering for many years because we've been like looking ahead at these risks. Um, Historically, probably the biggest risk was the ability to actually make the calcium carbonate into those rocks that you hopefully got to hold and uh, hopefully got to sort of like squish them in your hands and, and see that they were they were very pure and white and that they were strong. And um, that technology took uh, probably like five, six years to develop. Um, there were a lot of you know technical risks along the way and uh, as is the case in research and development, you sort of know what the 
things are that you're going to need to tackle and put long-term R&D on it and over time you make progress and eventually you come up with some creative breakthrough and, and are able to um, solve the problem. So I, that was a lot of uh, grinding and a lot of years of work, but I think we've um, done that. Another uh, risk that we've, uh, probably another big risk that, that we solved more recently was um, we are now, we used to use uh, heat for our process, and we now have a version of our process that's completely at ambient temperature and pressure. And that is, if you are a more technical person in the audience, you know that that is like a huge deal for carbon capture and carbon removal. So that was uh, one of the breakthroughs that I found the most exciting. We're talking a little more about that. So the lady in the back with the cool necklace. Okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. It's like a fun little piece. Cool necklace. Um, I think a couple of the panelists mentioned uh, transferring some of their technologies to low and middle income countries. And I was just curious about your experience transferring or uh, making that transfer, outreach that you did, the hurdles that you faced specifically. Um, I work for an NGO that looks to do exactly that, and taking transfer from the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, to one of the country. So I'd be really interested to know about your experience. That's awesome. Thank you for doing that work. Um, so what, so we work in pretty industrial, sites, so we would need uh, industrial partners that would presumably already have a lot of infrastructure in place for like bringing in raw materials for outputting literal tons of rock uh, and sand and gravel. And so we are looking at strategic um, locations, which would be amenable to that. So that's a, a big focus is sort of looking at Google Maps and seeing where we could get um, hubs set up where we would have everything that we needed for our process all in one place. And if you are exporting uh, gigaton, I guess not gigatons at a single plant, but if you're exporting many thousands of tons at a plant of aggregate, the uh, gravel and sand, you need a lot, and like one of the big considerations is you need just a lot of mass to be able to tra be transported in and out of those locations. So things like looking at places that already have barge access or already have rail access would be a big factor for um, sites that we would partner with. Um, and a lot of this is probably going to be helped by uh, international partners that we have. So we have um, uh, some of our investors and our technology partners are already uh, are already utilizing facilities all over the world. They're like multinational corporations, and so it should be. Uh, we should be able to like utilize these partnerships that we have with corporations that are all already multinational to be able to get that rolled out uh, much more easily than we would be able to just on our own as a very very small company. Um, yeah, I um, our technology eventually will get to a place where we can be make it possible to make fuels and chemicals in these products at a cost comparable to like conventional uh, fossil fuels at this point. But in the shorter term, it's gonna be you know more expensive. So we're working with within the US and Europe primarily uh, at the moment, like in the short next like few years. Um, but there's a benefit in, in companies like this, like with clean tech, uh, particularly with our company, because our systems are modular, we can help countries that are um, maybe like have a, don't have a chemicals industry or fuel production on their own um, and then only have to import, they can do that on their own and also provide local jobs and do it in a way that is scalable as opposed to having to build a giant plant which matches a plant that was built 50 years ago 
Um, so similar to how we should be bringing like clean energy to come to countries that are looking for energy instead of getting them to coal and then bringing solar, there's a way to leapfrog so that you know everyone is modernized in the same way, and we don't have to repeat all the ills of industrializing through fossil fuels. Um, so that's my and I think the one thing to address your question, I think there's an underlying concept that a lot of these technologies are more expensive, harder, et cetera, et cetera. And I think for certain technologies, especially in the concrete side, there is no green premium. It is cheaper to do it with carbon to value technologies than using the incumbent technologies. These are things that are ready to go, from, for lack of a word, from the global north to the global south. And just from my day job as, as a banker and an investor, a lot of the most valuable strategics are not in the global north, they're coming from the global south. And the one thing I also want to highlight, even though the, the Bay Area is, you know, it's always been an epicenter of innovation, a lot of the great technology companies on the climate side are now coming from places outside San Francisco. You know, there's some great companies out in India, there's some great things happening out in China and greater China. And I think these are things to be conscious of. It's, it's very easy when you're in San Francisco to think this is it. But there's a much bigger, broader climate world out there. Your answer? Your answer? No. Uh, yeah, I would just say, we, as a, a company that's licensing national lab technology, we um, are focused on launching our first facility in the United States. But we're also conducting discovery in Europe and we we'll plan to expand that to Southeast Asian countries because there is a very high carbon fiber demand there. And so I'd say come back to us uh, in a few years and we can better address that question. But I think uh, Kate, Heidi, and David um, yeah, provide some good insights there. All right, great. Um, a little word from our uh, venue and event manager. Let's give a hand to Angelina and Amani for uh, setting this up for us tonight. Hello, hello, hello. The mics got really excited that I'm coming on stage. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand because you guys can't sit, see me if I stand. Hi, welcome. My name is Angelina. If you don't know who I am, I'm the event and operations manager here. for coming out on a very, very hot day and attending this amazing, inspiring event about how we're going to save the future and what we can actually do about it in action steps. And thank you, Matt, and thank you to everyone on stage for this amazing event. Yes, clap to y'all. I'm going to go through some quick housekeeping rules, upcoming events, where you can find us, all the tea. Uh, first things first, uh, if you have trash, trash bins are this way, bathroom is this way, water is this way, exit is that way though. So make sure you leave that way, not that way. Second thing is we have some kick-ass events coming up in the next couple days. Tomorrow at 4 p.m., thank you, I haven't even said it in your class. Mark your calendars. We have the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations coming in conversation with Congresswoman Barbara Lee. It's going to be super exciting. It's a kick-ass event. It's something you're not going to find every day here in the city. 4 p.m. right here, right now. And then the following week, we have Valerie Biden Owens coming, who just released a book. It's Biden's sister. Please come to that. That is also almost sold out, so you need to get your tickets for that. And then amongst all that, we have more fun events. Manny, what do we have coming up other than those two kick-ass events? The Secretary of State event. Oh my god, that, see? Look, we have so many kick-ass <laughs> events, I forgot about the Secretary of State. Yeah, so that same week, next week, on the 13th, or yes, we have three Secretary of State candidates coming who are running in key states like Nevada and Arizona. And those are going to help us protect rights, especially reproductive rights, which, you know, that's it. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, and then for all of this information to figure out how to register, what's coming up, you can go to welcometomannies.com. All social media is at welcome to Mannies on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. If you have any questions, feel free to come see me or Manny. I think that's it. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to turn the music on, right, and I'm going to give the mic back. Thank you. I'm going to, you can, you can grab my, I'm like, just get rid of that. But I do want to point out, uh, if you want to visit ctan.cc slash poll, you can vote on our next uh, event. 
that will take you coincidentally to our Twitter feed where the, I put the poll up. Uh, we have a very small Twitter following, and if everybody in this room followed us on Twitter, it would probably about double our, <laughs> our Twitter followers. So please uh, follow us on Twitter, retweet, re Insta, re TikTok, whatever you want to do. Um, I want to thank again all of our panelists. Oh, yeah. Please return the Blue Planet samples to the stage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I really do want to thank all of our panelists and our moderator, David. David came into town for this, um, and these uh, three panelists are working at startups, and they work really hard, and they took time out of their day uh, to come here and talk to, to us, and I really want to thank all these people uh, and uh, for coming to speak with us. We also need to thank Matthew, who's kind of the guiding light behind all of this. He's the one who makes it happen. So, it's kind of Burning Man cool. I get a little old for that level of cool. But um, the one, time, one last thing I just want to say, because I always close with this. Uh, so, buy a drink and um, support Manny's. But um, I think one of the things that comes into mind a lot when thinking about climate tech is the size of the problem relative to the size of the contribution that any individual can make. We're trying to take a crack at systemic solutions to a systemic problem here. Engineering is a tool that we can use to make an impact that's much greater than any single one of us. But it's still pretty overwhelming to think about. Um, and I know a lot of people who work in this space suffer from a lot of exhaustion from thinking about it day in and day out. Um, and uh, the thing that I always keep in mind that I uh, put up on a slide last time, I forgot to make a closing slide for this one, but um, one, of the great, um, one of the great sages, Rabbi Tarfun, famously said, um, it's not for you to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to abstain from taking part in it. So every time you get up and you go to work and you do one good thing that's pushing us towards a more equitable and just future, uh, you are doing everything that you need to do. You don't need to do everything. You just need to go and find one thing that you can do to make a more equitable and just future. Thank you for coming out today.